We do. That's on Tuesday, September 25th at 8 p.m. in the summer. And Joy Olson is a guest of the Washington Office of Latin America. They are speaking about shaping a new U.S. policy for Latin America. That one's on Wednesday, September 26th at 7 p.m. in the South Ballroom. We also encourage you to attend the Political Action Week speakers on Central Campus all week from 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. each day, and that closes at noon on Friday with Barack Obama. He's going to be speaking on the importance of political activism. Um, also, we are going to have a reception after uh, or at the conclusion of tonight's speech, so we invite you to uh, stick around uh, afterwards for that. And uh, now, without further ado, um, tonight's feature uh, presentation, Tom Fleener. Tom Fleener is an attorney and former Guantanamo Bay Military Defense Counsel. He's been an outspoken critic and public commentator on the use of special military trials for terrorist suspects. He served as an Army JAG officer for eight years, both prosecuting and defending soldiers around the world. A native Iowan and graduate of Plains High School, he left the active Army in 2003 to take an appointment as an assistant uh, federal public defender. He was recalled <laughs> to active duty in 2005 to represent alleged Al-Qaeda propagandist Ali Hamza al balu of Yemen. During the two years in the Office of Military Commissions in Washington, D.C., he made several appearances before a military commission in Guantanamo Bay, until ultimately convincing Congress to afford detainees a choice of counsel. I first had the honor of speaking with Mr. Fleener this summer as an intern with the Ames Tribune, um, during which uh, he uh, told me about the, the details of his time with uh, Mr. Uh, Al Balu, and um, from there uh, things kind of happened, and uh, we invited him to come here. So, without further ado, Tom Fleener. Attorneys to get out 
and speak publicly on behalf either of their putative client or on behalf of a cause and to bring some important issues, I guess, to public light. And, you know, I don't know whether it was done in, I'm not naive, I don't know whether it was altruistic that they just let the lawyers go out and say terrible things about the president or whether they believe that it's okay, it's rather better to have three or four rogue military lawyers running around the country saying terrible things than trying to figure out something up in a federal court somewhere. So, the motives aside, they have always been very, very good at letting us get out and talk. I was here Friday for Madeleine Albright's thing and a smaller crowd, I understand, not Madeleine Albright. But I do appreciate those who did come and I, you know, I do much better with question and answer format. So, I'm not going to talk for a few minutes and then when you guys have any questions, you can either ask me questions in the middle of it, I can care less. You can wait until the end and ask me questions, that doesn't matter to me either. If I don't know the answer, I'm a lawyer, so I'll make it up. You'll never know the difference, I promise you. That's a joke. You'll never know, that's the best part about it. One of the other interesting things about being a Guantanamo Bay defense lawyer is I was a federal public defender in Wyoming for a few years before getting involved in Gitmo and as a criminal defense attorney, you're generally not on the right side of the law and you have bad clients. Your guys did it, you don't have much of a defense, you're usually just trying to come up with whatever you can to create reasonable doubt or to get the judge or the jury to hang on something. And one of the big ironies, I guess, of being a defense attorney in Guantanamo was that we were always right and it was uncomfortable being a defense lawyer and being right because I'm used to having to sort of pitch things a little bit and very rarely do you get to speak the truth. And so, but what we were doing down in Guantanamo was, you know, we just were always right on that stuff and we would listen to the administration's lawyers and I would engage in folks at various symposia around the country and debating high-level administration folks in the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense and I'd listen to them and they were just wrong and it was always interesting being right on something when you're usually having to make something up to see if it's a representation of evidence you can. I'm going to start, I guess, with a quote and Ben Franklin, it's a tribute to Ben Franklin, I don't know if he actually said it, I wasn't alive, Ben Franklin's dead so he's not here to rebut that so I'm going to go ahead and say it's Ben Franklin. He said something, he who gives up freedom for liberty deserves neither. There's been all sorts of bastardizations of that. But essentially what Ben Franklin said is that if you start getting into fear in order to have increased levels of security and give up your individual freedoms, then the damage you deserve neither. And unfortunately after 9-11 I think what we've done as a country, and in particular as the administration, the executive branch of our government has done, is truly embrace the concept of fear and the concept of security and to the detriment of, certainly the detriment of individual liberty, but probably even greater than that. So I believe we are in a constitutional crisis and those who are political science majors or lawyers or anybody else out in the audience, I mean the Constitution does a couple different things. I mean it grants us individual liberties and a lot of what the lawyers, the Guantanamo Bay defense lawyers were arguing down in Gitmo and Washington and elsewhere is that detainees in Guantanamo Bay have constitutional rights. Guantanamo Bay is like America and they have constitutional rights. I personally believe that's true, whether that proves to be true in the next eight months or so after the Supreme Court decides the next couple cases will be, I guess we'll know then. But the Constitution also does something else rather than simply protecting individual rights and liberties. And it's a restriction on government and it's a restriction on not only the state and the federal government, it tells what the state and the federal government gets to do, but it also tells what the different branches of the executive, or excuse me, the branches of the federal government, what their rules are. It creates checks and balances, it creates 
uh, separation of powers. And what's happened in the last five years, six years since 9-11, certainly since the end of, of 2001, so it's coming up on six years, is that the, the president in his role of, of being the commander-in-chief of our, of our armed forces uh, truly believes that everything that he does, as long as he assumes the role of commander-in-chief, everything that he does regarding, regarding uh, uh, military tactics, to detention policies, to interrogation techniques, to setting up special military trials, to try terrorist suspects, that Congress and the courts have nothing to do with any of it because of this theory of the unitary executive combined with the concept of him being a commander-in-chief in wartime, he, he gets to be able to just decide everything and no one else has anything to say. Um, that's, it gets wrong. Uh, unfortunately, in the last few years, we've had extraordinarily compliant Congress who let the executive do really whatever the executive wanted to do, and Congress really should should uh, have to answer, and I think they did answer a little bit to that in 2006 with 38 seats changing parties, 36 seats changing parties, whatever it was. Uh, they'll probably answer for it again in 2008. Um, but Congress certainly advocated, I believe, advocated its role as uh, it, its involvement in the checks and balance and separation of power system and letting the president do whatever the president wanted to do, uh, wanted to do with Guantanamo Bay. Um, Traditionally, and, and, and the reason why, and what the executive branch always argued is that, you know, a president in war gets to do, I mean, he gets to fight the wars, he gets to make the decisions because he's the only person, he's, he's, he controls the troops on the ground, and that's why uh, he runs the show in war. And all of that was, was fine and dandy traditionally because what we're dealing with, of course, in uh, World War I, World War II, and Vietnam were, were traditional wars where you had a defined enemy, you had a defined border, you had a defined start and end date, and you were fighting a traditional war with a, with a traditional enemy. The problem is that when you when you start to do what, what the executive wanted to do after 2001, which is declare war against a non-state actor, uh, that <coughs> you lose all the, the, the sort of common sense restrictions that are naturally in place in a traditional war. You know who the enemy is. You know, they're wearing a uniform, running around with guns. Um, uh, they speak uh, they speak German. We know that the Germans are you hold them as POWs. We know where we captured them. We know where we're at war. We know when the war started. We know when the war's going to end. When there's an armistice. Um, he wanted all that. They wanted to have all the power of the presidency under the exact, under their uh, theory of being a commander in chief. They want yet they wanted none of the restrictions that would ordinarily a uh, the the um, a traditional armed conflict would have with. Which is like the law of war. Uh, traditionally, you follow, you have a war, but there's a law of war, and the law of war is the Geneva Conventions. Um, the president opted out of the Geneva Conventions and said we don't need to apply the Geneva Conventions. Well, that's that's because Attorney General Gonzalez said that they're a quaint, I believe, with some of the one of the phrases. It's terrible. Um, and yet, you know, I lived in D.C. as a as a military officer, having listened to this stuff, it's, it's mind boggling. The Geneva Conventions are quaint. I mean, the Geneva Conventions essentially is the constitution for uh, uh, the, for the law, for, the, for battlefields, for, for, for military engagements. It's like saying the constitution is quaint. We don't have the constitution anymore because we decided to look at something else. Um, but when the administration decided to opt out of the application of the Geneva Conventions, which I'll get to in a second, we spiraled down this this path where where we are today, which is where. Uh, Guantanamo Bay is, is just a, is a, is a, a legal black hole, it's a black eye, and it, the rest of the world uh, condemns it, and it certainly, if, uh, if you want to know why, as Americans, we should be concerned for what, what's happening in Guantanamo Bay, and I, I, I tell you, and again, you have to be right on this, unfortunately, I mean, Guantanamo Bay has an absolute direct effect on the war in Iraq. Um, you know, the war in Iraq maybe didn't have a was it central to the war on terror when we went there? Um, unfortunately, it is now because, and one of the rallying cries in Iraq is, remember Guantanamo Bay. Um, we have, we have sort of lost the moral high ground, and when you start 
picking up people from wherever we pick them up, taking them to a little island in the Caribbean, saying that they have no rights whatsoever, um, interrogating them under conditions which would be defined as torture if we didn't redefine the word torture so they, they didn't become torture, and setting up uh, essentially mock trials to, uh, to, try, these, to try these people. Um, when you do things like that, the rest of the world starts to uh, question your leadership, and it certainly is questioning our ability to get things done in Iraq. Uh, now, for Guantanamo. Uh, Guantanamo opened in, in uh, January of 2002, and I mean, if you guys have any questions like, about what my involvement was, I have this whole section about what I did and how I got to Gitmo and what was going on in Gitmo, but um, I'm going to I could talk for days on this stuff, and it's Monday night, and the football game is away. Uh, there's no reason to do that in the um, So I'll, I'll let all that stuff go. If you have any questions, you can certainly ask me. Uh, but I guess I'm just going to get right into sort of the, some of the legal issues in Guantanamo uh, and some of the factual considerations that were down there. Um, now, I understand, I guess, we back up to, to after 9-11, where we invade Afghanistan, um, supported certainly by Congress and the rest of the world. We have troops on the ground. We're at war with Afghanistan. Um, we quickly overthrow the Taliban government, and pe people are captured, captured in Afghanistan and elsewhere late in 2001, and we want to know what we're going to do with them. Well, in, in a traditional battle, in a traditional battlefield, in a traditional war, if we had invaded Germany or Japan and we captured a bunch of Japanese or German fighters, we know what we would do. We would treat them as POWs. You move them to the rear. You can interrogate them using humane, using, using humane tactics. But you essentially keep them until the war is over, and you repatriate them to their home country. Um, what we were treating Afghanistan like, and, and, and this may be the right answer, I, I'm not really sure, that we were more concerned with gathering intelligence and, and finding out whether we were going to be harmed or uh, than we were treating this like a traditional battlefield. So what we started to do was prisoners that, that were captured uh, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and elsewhere were, were interrogated in uh, uh, Kandahar and uh, other on ships uh, in uh, in the ocean, and then uh, to try to gather information from them before ultimately they were moved to Guantanamo Bay. Um, and they were moved to Guantanamo Bay for a reason, and, and uh, most of you will probably know this, but there, there's been a great debate about what is Guantanamo Bay. Is Guantanamo Bay uh, Cuba? Is Guantanamo Bay America? Is Guantanamo Bay something in between? If so, what? If it, whatever it is, what is the law that applies it? Well, the administration believed, and they did a great deal of research on this, and um, had a memorandum drafted that, that essentially said, look, Guantanamo Bay, uh, it's Cuba, but the Cuban law doesn't apply. Really, no law applies. So if you want to put people and have them not have access to U.S. courts, the U.S. courts won't reach Guantanamo Bay to them. That was their belief in 2001, and they believe it. I, I, I think they still believe it to, to, uh, to this day. There have been several uh, court opinions uh, that have come out against it, and there will be a couple more that come out in 2007, probably, uh, against it as well. Um, so they, but they were looking for a place where they could hold people for as long as they wanted, which was until the end of hostilities. And they wanted to be able to interrogate and gather information, and they didn't want restrictions on what, how they gathered information. Uh, they didn't want to have to be bound by the Geneva Conventions on how they would treat prisoners of war. So uh, they asked some of their lawyers to figure out whether or not the Geneva Convention would apply. And in January 2002, um, the, uh, the Office of Legal Counsel offered an opinion which said, by the way, the Geneva Conventions don't apply to the war, uh, to, to the war in Afghanistan, uh, because Afghanistan was a failed nation state because uh, Geneva Conventions only apply to international and non-international armed conflicts, and this is neither, because the Taliban is the government of a failed state, and because Al-Qaeda is a lawless militia that's not affiliated, uh, affiliated with, a, with a lawful uh, government, therefore the Geneva, Geneva Conventions don't apply whatsoever at all to the Taliban or to Al-Qaeda or to the Taliban either. 
Um, that, that opinion has been, that memorandum has been widely criticized, especially regarding the application of the Geneva Convention to the Taliban, because the Taliban was, whether we liked it or not, it was a lawful government in Afghanistan, and um, the, the Taliban soldiers should have been, should have been provided Geneva, Geneva rights. But we said no, and what we decided to do was interrogate the folks and uh, gather as much information as we possibly could. Unfortunately, when we were gathering people, and this is what I, you know, I, before September of 2006, there had been roughly a thousand people in and out of Guantanamo Bay detention centers. And, and I, I can tell you with, with absolute certainty that there were no big fish, um, Al Qaeda leaders, uh, high profile terrorists in Guantanamo Bay. Truly, what was in Guantanamo Bay, this is the same time that the administration is telling you, telling us that these people are the worst of the worst, uh, plucked from the battlefields of Afghanistan, fighting Americans, who are so bad that we have to chain them to the floor of the C-130 airplanes, because if we go, they're going to shoot through the hydraulic cables and have the planes go down. <laughs> that's, who they, that's what they said we had down there. Um, and, right, first hand experience, I, I tell you that, now there are some, I mean, there are some bad people in, in Guantanamo Bay. We shipped 14 really bad people there in September 2006. We finally have some real terrorists in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, mastermind of 9 11, Abu Zabeya, Ramzi bin al Sheikh, and some of the leading terrorist suspects in the country. They're there now. They're there now. Uh, they weren't there for five years. Uh, the people who were there literally, um, whether the majority of them were actually innocent of doing anything wrong, or a strong plurality of them will actually listen to doing anything wrong. The bottom line is, you had, unlike a, a, a justice system where you had, you have people that have been, even if you're held in pretrial custody, I mean, I was a, a federal public defender, most of my clients did it, um, and certainly post trial custody, while there certainly are innocent people in prisons, federal and state in the United States, the vast majority of them did. It's not like that in Guantanamo Bay. You truly have a, a significant portion of the population in Gitmo who did absolutely nothing wrong. And they weren't picked up from the, from the battlefield in Afghanistan fighting Americans. 94%, <clears throat> all but 6% were picked up by other than American forces. Now this is Afghan warlords, Pakistani intelligence forces, um, different groups of people around the world that or turning over members of Al Qaeda or the Taliban to uh, to the U.S. military. Um, unfortunately, this is the same time we're offering we're offering bounties. We're dropping leaflets through the through uh, Afghanistan and, and Pakistan, saying turn uh, turn over the ter turn over the terrorists to the United States, to Americans, free your country, five thousand American dollars for members of the Taliban, twenty five thousand dollars for America for members of Al Qaeda. Uh, it's a great deal of money in America, or in Afghanistan, and Pakistan, and people were literally turning over shepherds, um, hospital aid workers uh, in Pakistan, journalists, uh, bookkeepers, bankers, their neighbors uh, throughout Afghanistan and Pakistan. You had people being turned over that had absolutely nothing to do with terrorism. And then what we would do is we would take those folks, and, and you know, in the middle of that, you also had some bad guys who were turned over. Al Qaeda fighters, Taliban fighters, some of them were also turned over in that mess. But what we did is we took everybody and we lumped them all together. And we said that, you know, this is January 2002. From January 2002 to the middle of 2004, when the Supreme Court decided a case called Rasul versus Bush, the administration's position was that. Effort that there, there needed to be no inter, no judicial, certainly no judicial intervention, uh, and no intervention of any kind by any branch of government into Guantanamo Bay. And there's no one that had to tell tell the administration, no one could tell the administration that uh, there needs to be some showing that the people that you picked up are terrorists, members of Al Qaeda, Taliban, or whatever. The administration believed that there was there because the war, or excuse me, the Geneva Convention didn't apply. Remember, there needed to be no determination to, to figure out who these people were. In a regular war with the Geneva Convention was one, you have what's called an Article Five tribunal. 
we talked about this during dinner today, where people are, if you have a, you, if you have a doubt, you take somebody off the battlefield. What's supposed to happen in traditional armed conflict is you treat the person as a POW, and then you have this little tribunal to determine uh, what the hell this person is. Is he a military guy? Is he a civilian? Is he a child? Is he an unlawful combatant of some sort? Is he from some foreign country that we uh, seem to uh, mercenary? But you, you have these determinations done on the battlefield to figure out who these people are. Well, because none of these people were plucked off the battlefield, and, none of these, and because we didn't have to determine, the administration really didn't have to go through any of these determinations to figure out who these people were, everyone was just taken to Guantanamo Bay, and you had started mixing the good with the bad, and then you started interrogating them, and, and you know, unfortunately, you know, I torturing many folks down there, so that the information that they gathered, once you're being, once you're being mistreated, uh, and you start giving up people's names and making up, making up statements, some of the information the United States was gathering was good information, but some of it was just terrible and false. And how do you tell if it's terrible and false versus good information when you're doing the same sort of course of interrogation techniques and you're getting all this information and there's no outside source <laughs> or force telling you what you have to do and who you have to listen to and whether somebody needs to stay or to help. What happened is that for two and a half years we gathered all this information under some really, really unsavory methods. Um, and we've heard about the black sites where the United States had um, the CIA was in some of it gets classified, and some of the police said, I'm always afraid to say stuff because I'm going to get in jail. But you know, in, in Eastern Europe, with Romania and Poland, and some other places where we had sites that were specifically set up to um, go after some of the higher level terrorist suspects. But there's terrible things were happening. Um, but in Guantanamo Bay, prior to 2004, really bad things were happening as well. Because again, before 2004, there were no lawyers in Guantanamo. There were no journalists in Guantanamo. Um, the administration's position was that they had carte blanche to do they wanted. So you had techniques like waterboarding, where you hold people upside down, rags up their faces, water up in their faces, it seemed like you're drowning. Um, and then uh, after a few seconds, they would gag and spit and then come up and you'd ask them what you know, something, and they wouldn't say they'd put you back down and they would do it again. Uh, they, they did um, terrible, terrible um, acts of sleep deprivation, which sounds peaceful, but anybody who has a, a mental health background will tell you what, you know, 40 days of no sleep, or altering your sleep patterns such that you're woken up uh, at a particular time for two hours and then let sleep for, you know, 15 minutes and woke up again for 35 hours and let sleep another 30 minutes. What that does to the mind, it does actually creates this form of psychosis where, um, you know, the information you tell them uh, isn't all that reliable either, but again, there's no way to tell whether it's reliable or not because we're doing this to everybody. Uh, the use of the use of, uh, of dogs, which is a, is a common fear of uh, Muslims, um, sexual humiliation, fake menstrual blood, making people dirty during Ramadan or during prayers so they weren't able to pray, um, terrible beatings, um, Lights, use the use of strobe lights and rock music uh, in stress positions where you get you get short shackled to the floor like this for hours and hours, and the lights would be completely turned off. And in one time of day, it's just hot as hell. Um, and then no air conditioning, so you they turn the heat completely off or off, so it would be incredibly hot. And then they would play uh, loud heavy metal music and have strobe lights. Going off and on and off and on, which again doesn't sound that bad, uh, but I encourage you to watch the movie Road to Guantanamo. It's on DVD, and if for 10 seconds watch the demonstration of the short chat and the strobe lights, then you'll go nuts. Um, and then alter the, alter the temperatures. And, and this was all in an effort to gather intelligence, um, you know, presumably, I don't certainly intend to keep bad faith on, on the behalf of, of, of our people. I think the US President truly wants to gather information to protect us. The question is to what extent do you gather the information? To what extent do you give up freedom and, and give up the moral high ground to gain that little added level of security? All that went on through, throughout 2004. Um, plenty of hunger strikes, uh, suicides, suicide attempts. 
You know, when you hear the worst of the worst group in Guantanamo Bay, the youngest person recognized by the government to be in Guantanamo Bay was 10. And no one ever hears that. And, it, and the oldest was either 90, 94, or 105. The government says he was 90. He says he was 105. And there are various other sources that indicate uh, he was actually 94. So when you hear that about these terrible, terrible folks we had down there for years and years, and why you can't move them to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, again, understand, the youngest was 10, the oldest was 90, 94, 105, depends on, on, on who you want to believe. Um, we, we decided, as we're doing the interrogations, the government was worried that people were going to get in trouble for torture. It's against federal law to torture people. It's probably a good law to have on the books. So they asked, uh, asked uh, a couple of lawyers in the Department of Justice, Jay Bybee, who's now on the Ninth Circuit, uh, Court of Appeals, a tenured federal judge, and John, you were a professor at Cal Berkeley, right the place of the debate for the federal judges in California a few months ago. And that was a good time. They asked him to draw up the infamous torture memos to, to um, tell them whether or not, what exactly torture is, what can you do to people, and have it not be torture. You know, and I've said this to a bunch of different audiences, you know, the first thing that I would hope that a bunch of government lawyers would say when they're being asked to determine the very outer limits of what's acceptable behavior before it turns into torture is they would step back and say, you know, what the hell am I doing? I'm asking, I'm being asked to gain torture. Um, if I'm pushing the envelope on, on torture, I probably shouldn't be doing that. I probably shouldn't be pushing the envelope. Why don't we just treat people okay and not have to worry about torture? But they wrote the, the infamous torture memo, which uh, gave this incredibly narrow definition of torture, where they said that torture only is if it's only torture if the interrogator has a specific intent to torture. Meaning, if I, as long as I'm trying to get information from Gavin, and I'm beating the shit out of Gavin, and, and waterboarding Gavin, whatever I want to do to Gavin, as long as I'm trying to get information from him. Uh, I don't have the specific agenda to torture, and that's just, you know, an aside that we have to be uh, gathering information that an interrogator won't be guilty of, won't be guilty of the crime, which is absurd. Uh, and oh, by the way, if we're wrong on that, it's unconstitutional, it would be unconstitutional to, uh, prosecute somebody who tortured somebody if the president, if it was done under the president's lawful Authority as the commander in chief of the armed forces. So he gives, he tells CIA or military defense interrogators that it's okay to waterboard or that, it, that that's not torture. Go ahead and get the information that he can do whatever he wants in wartime. That's okay. And to prosecute those who would do the torture is unconstitutional, uh, an unconstitutional uh, invasion of his rights as commander in chief. Um, that's half nuts. Uh, in 2004, the regime changed. The uh, detainees fought their way into federal court. A case called Rasul versus Bush came out, which, which said that, um, that, that at least under the, the, the habeas corpus statute, there's two types of habeas corpus. One, habeas corpus is the legal principle that says essentially if they're ready to release the body, it's, it's to it's to, um, it says, it's to be used if the executive branch, or back in the day, if the king was holding somebody, then the king had to show why you're being held to some judicial body. Uh, the government said, hey, this court doesn't apply to the Gitmo. Um, Rasul versus Bush said it does, at least through the statute, for the Haiti statute as well, as being brought in the Constitution and the Magna Carta and the Bill of and in 2004, when they said that the Constitution, that at least their statutory act rights to habeas, things changed, and detainees um, then presumably had some sort of legal rights and had was able to have a great round of cases heard. Unfortunately, what the administration, when that opinion came out in 2004, the administration did not want the judicial branch intervening um, into Guantanamo Bay, and they convinced Congress to to. Uh, passed what's called the Detainee Treatment Act of 2005, which attempted to strip habeas corpus from the, the courts. In a case called Hamdan versus Rumsfeld, the, the court said, no, we still have access, the detainees still um, have some access to courts. Congress went back in, the administration went back in December, they were in uh, 
fall 2006, and got Congress to pass the military duty in 2006, which is a terrible, 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 disgusting piece of legislation. Um, I think Audubon Bismarck said that the two things you don't want to watch being named are sausage and legislation. Uh, I haven't. Yeah, we're in Iowa. I guess that's an appropriate joke. But uh, it, it's true because you know, I happened to be down in D.C. And, and suddenly, you know, there were five or six military warriors who had all this knowledge of military commissions, the Uniform Code of the Military Justice, the legal response to the war on terror, and everything else. And we were, received all sorts of inquiries and calls from members of Congress, both in the House and the Senate, um, primarily Democrats, some Republicans, and. Several of us, a few of us anyway, engaged with many, many members of their staffs and tried to explain what was going on and why the military commission process was so bad. Um, one example we used was I had a, I had a guy at one time uh, who was scheduled to be tried before a military commission, and uh, I was going I was going back and forth with the presiding officer of the military judge of this thing in front of you know, international media and uh, in many media in the United States. And, I asked the judge, I said, Judge, if, if there's evidence that's derived from torture that's offered against my client, are you going to let that in? And he said, he, he said, well, let's talk about if, if there was evidence that came from sticking red hot needles in people's eyes, would I let that into evidence? And I thought, well, I'm going to win this one because we're talking about sticking red hot needles in people's eyes in front of everybody. Um, you know the answer to this. He said, well, uh, I can't say that I would exclude it. We have to see it. I have to balance it to determine whether it's you know, appropriate or not. Instead of just saying, you know, like I was sitting here with people's eyes, of course, you can't know the lawful system of justice, whatever that happens, or I'm sitting here with people's eyes. We have to do a balancing test to determine whether it's reliable. Um, the military commission process had so many changes to it. I mean, once I engaged the judge on this, Sticking the needle in people's eyes, about a week later, the Department of Defense issued some little instruction which said, No more evidence that's derived from sticking the needle in people's eyes is going to be admissible in a military trial. <laughs> and I thought, Well, that's, I'm glad I asked the question because then I asked the question that the little instruction would have come out and they would have been able to stick the needle in people's eyes. But then that's what, I mean, when, when you read the Geneva, when you, you don't read the Geneva Convention, the Geneva Conventions talk about a regularly constituted court. One thing that a regularly constituted court is not is a court where I peep around back and I stick needles in people's eyes and a week later some rule comes out which says you can no longer get evidence that's derived from sticking needles in people's eyes. That's not a regularly constituted court. A regularly constituted court has uh, some sort of basis in statutes and, and uh, usually involves Congress and, and the judiciary. Um, but when Congress started working on the military commissions after 2006, uh, it it truly was a, a extraordinarily disheartening for me. I, I believe that after Hong Kong, the country and Congress would certainly see that the, the right approach to the war on terror, at least our legal response to the war on terror, is to treat people well and to uh, protect America and to keep dangerous people away from us but to not engage in torture, to not create a justice system which provides uh, different levels of rights depending on what color your skin is or what, where you happen to be from. Um, I guess I'm a little idealist, but I believe that after during that summer that we would uh, we wouldn't have a, a military commission back. If we did, it would provide a fair system of justice. And what happened is fear again um, reared its ugly head and. The Military Conditions Act of 2006 was passed by, our, by the Republican Congress. Um, no hearings, three days of, of, of hearings, never sent to committee. Um, and I was in the know on this, and I you know I would get the, the various drafts would be leaked from the various players in the process. The administration had a draft, draft bill, and some staffer in Congress would send them to me and my friends, and we would read it. And we knew all the stuff, so we would, you know, send emails back and forth on what the good provisions, what the bad provisions. You know, but watching this thing develop was uh, just a, an extraordinarily disgusting, terrible, disheartening mess. And what happened was the, the Congress actually created a system of justice that um, allows evidence, that prohibits evidence that's derived from torture. Um, 
but allows you to launder the evidence that's derived from the court to provide, having unlimited hearsay, having the burden to be on the defendant to show that evidence is unreliable, or having the how evidence was taken is classified so no one gets to figure out how the evidence is taken, from whom is the evidence taken, where is the evidence taken. It's just detaining X told me that your guy did it. Um, I'm not able to find out who the interrogator was, who took the information, who he took the information from, and under what conditions he took the information, and the burden is on the defense to show somehow that evidence is unreliable. That's the military community that in 2006. It allows evidence that's derived from cruel and humane and degrading treatment, which is torture light, waterboarding, for instance. That's not admissible after it taken after December of 2005, but it's fine and dandy to use that evidence as long as it's taken prior to December of 2005. Well, uh, all the evidence in one time was better taken prior to December of 30, December, of, you know, December of 2005, and it's not. Well, why is it? Why would evidence that's taken from the prior to December of 2005 be more reliable? Now, I waterboard Gavin uh, Christmas Eve of 2005. No disrespect, Gavin, and he tells me something. Um, that evidence is somehow admissible. But if I waterboard Gavin on New Year's Eve of 2005, um, that evidence is not admissible. What, why, why would it be any more reliable? What makes that evidence more reliable than in December of 2005? It may, it, there's no rationale for it. Um, other than it's sort of watching how legislation is drafted and how politics is done. Um, so now we're stuck with the military commission after 2006. 2006. It strips habeas corpus again from detainees um, and provides no access to courts, limited access to courts. There's still great questions as to whether um, uh, exactly what rights apply in Guantanamo Bay, if any. The courts have been, have been involved now slowly, uh, and they're, they're starting to press the administration a little bit on some of its positions and some of its policies. And I offer, I guess, uh, and I'll close now, but I offer three, three solutions, I guess, for in, uh, history of, or in recognition of Constitution Day. Um, Guantanamo Bay should be closed. Senator Harkin, a great senator from Iowa, proposed legislation to close Guantanamo Bay and move, move the detainees to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Um, that's the best piece of legislation on that issue out there. Uh, and People should support Tom Harkin and Guantanamo Bay should be closed. If we want to do well in Iraq, Guantanamo Bay should be closed. If we want to do well in the internet and guide the international community, certainly Guantanamo Bay needs to be closed. Um, and detainees need to be moved either to, to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, um, or somewhere else uh, where there's some sort of regular, regular uh, access to the various things that normal people would have in, in a jail. Um, Second thing about Kiko and Abu Ghraib, and, and you know, uh, you heard about Abu Ghraib, of course, and the, the Abu Ghraib didn't just happen. General, uh, General Jeff Miller, who was the commander, who was the first of the 70th interrogation centers in Guantanamo Bay, guess where he went after getting The little place called Abu Ghraib. Um, so, you know, when, when, you, when, you, when you argue, when you, I, I hear these arguments all the time, I argue with a lot of my, my conservative friends that, you know, that, one out of way is different than the one Iraq and you can look at differently. I, I think now it's, it used to be different when it didn't have anything to do with one another when we told it did. Um, now actually has something to do with one another. Uh, that, that Abu Ghraib and the Black Eye of Abu Ghraib is a direct result of one time of that. It's a direct result of the abdication of Geneva Conventions and saying that we don't have to apply the law of war. There, are, there is no rules of war that apply that, that requires our, but that all, all, uh, People held in the war on terror and sea. Um, second thing I would, have, would argue, and this is some legislation that's being brought by uh, Senator Arlen Specter, Republican, and uh, uh, Pat Leahy, the two leaders on the Judiciary Committee in the Senate, to restore the right of habeas corpus to uh, detainees in Guantanamo Bay. Um, when it's being offered by the Republicans and the Democrats, I don't think we'll recognize it's not a, probably a decent thing. Uh, and our inspector, while he didn't vote for the military commission death, he said it's unconstitutional, but I'm voting for it anyway. Um, he's at least on the right side on restoring habeas. What that does, all that does, I mean, no federal judge has ever ordered the release of anybody held in Guantanamo Bay. Now, there has not been one fact-finding hearing on what's going on in Guantanamo Bay anymore. 
not one. So don't play all those activist judges or they've been releasing people and they'll just get, if we didn't, if we didn't uh, uh, revoke the, or revoke the habeas, the right of habeas, the activist judges would have released everybody. It's just crap. It's, it's just at all, it's just not at all true. Heard it, you already wow. guessed it, but it's not true. Um, there's nothing wrong with having detainees in Guantanamo where they have access to courts. Uh, it wouldn't be a drain on the, on the judicial system. What it would do is it would provide some level of transparency, which I would argue is a good thing. They're not gathering any more intelligence. They're just holding people in one time or that. Let them have access to courts if necessary, at least in some limited fashion. And then finally, uh, there's going to be several proposals through Congress, uh, the most recent Congress, to abolish or significantly alter the military commissions act. That is a good thing. What we don't want, we don't want to put on show trials. There's been one conviction in Guantanamo Bay. There's been one trial in Guantanamo Bay. And I'll close with this. And I'll, then I'll let you, I'll let you decide for yourself if it sounds um, like a, a way a system of justice should work. For the worst of the worst. David Hicks, the only white guy in Guantanamo Bay. I don't know whether that's a coincidence or not, but I guess we'll leave that for the day. Uh, who happened to be from Australia at the same time the Australian government, government is really getting its, its uh, really getting beat up in the press because a colleague of mine, Major Dan Moore, who was representing David Hicks, was over there in, in Australia night and day um, as a wonderful, wonderful advocate. Um, then the Marines went after him for saying that he was uh, threatening the United States for Iraq in few months. Um, but he turned public opinion in Australia. So what the Australians did <coughs> for David Hicks, the worst of the worst, is uh, told the Americans that, you know, we let you have our guy forever. Um, he needs to be tried soon. So, Dan Mori, on the eve of the first arraignment in Guantanamo Bay, let his guy out to whatever the charge was. I believe material support of the terrorist organization conspiracy. In return, the worst of the worst, his sentence was how much? Nine months. Right. Like a third DUI. Um, <laughs> and he got to serve his time in Australia. And he can't, uh, he, had to, he had to stay on the record that he wasn't mistreated by the Americans. And he has to get out after his nine months until um, uh, the Prime Minister Howard has his elections in, in uh, World War. That's the only guy to be convicted before the military commission. Two months later, they had no, they started having these trials again. And the military judges threw out the charges because they said, we don't have jurisdiction to try anybody in Guantanamo Bay because the military commissions act. Uh, only allows us to try on law funding combatants rather than, than law funding combatants. Well, Dan Moore knew that. But had he raised that issue, where would David Hicks be right now? He'd be in one time with that. So he has to plead his guy out before an illegal court that doesn't have jurisdiction, knowing that the court doesn't have jurisdiction, in order to get his nine month deal and get out to one time with that. Um, it's, it's not a system of justice. It's not something the Americans should be proud of. It's an affront, uh, it's an affront to all of us. It's certainly an affront to the Constitution. I thank you for your time. I'm sorry I continue to talk. I can't stop this way. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions anybody would have about any of this stuff. Sir. All right. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you're welcome. David Clinton, for your service to our country and especially your service to the Constitution of the United States of America. Thank you. In these grim times. My name is Michael Bruski. I write for Washington for the Women's Affairs and uh, the Independent Monitor of the National Impact of Bear Americans. Uh, two questions come to mind right off. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the ramifications of the legal issues associated with the detainee in Guantanamo Bay? Such as the denial of behavior, behavior corpus, um, the ramifications of those issues for American citizens in this country who are engaged in dissent and civil disobedience. Do you want the second question now? Or you... No, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> well, you know, the, the Military Commission Act is interesting because what it does is it, um, it does just apply to, to Guantanamo, but the Military Commission Act, we, uh, Congress and Infinite Wisdom, set up a separate system of justice. For not terrorist suspects in Guantanamo Bay, but for aliens, and it's not just aliens that are held, you know, somewhere in, in the middle of nowhere. It's aliens, uh, lawful registered, law, lawful aliens in the United States, uh, illegal aliens. Uh, so, as far as people in America 
do I, do I believe that, that uh, Americans have would somehow all pray to the military commissions act? I would hope not. I certainly think that there's equal protection issues with the military commissions act, and that I wouldn't want to be a Middle Easterner um, of Middle Eastern descent in the United States, whether I was lawful or unlawful, uh, especially if I was a um, uh, an outspoken critic of, of this process. So I think really. Um, the answer to your question is, I, I, is it certainly has, I think it has a direct effect on lawful and lawful aliens, lawful resident aliens in the United States, and illegal aliens. Um, the effect it has on Americans, on the rest of on the, uh, the uh, uh, suspension of habeas corpus and other issues with the Military Commission Act is probably more tangential. Which, uh, you know, any, any, anytime you reduce your level of freedom as Americans, we suffer that kind of thing. I think it's actually broader than that because what it has done is that the same mentality and same justification for passing the military commissions act for suspending habeas corpus has allowed the government to um, to, to uh, now have a terrorist surveillance program. You know that that was domestic spying or illegal wiretapping for about two days before Tony Snow got involved and it's gone back up and suddenly the, I had the first savings plan the TSP and that became the terrorist surveillance program. Um, so I think that there's certainly the same uh, legal justifications and rationale as has allowed the government to take other issues with Americans in Chicago and Second question. Uh, yes, you mentioned your colleague who uh, defended the Australian detainee. Damn good people. It's a, it's a damn good people. Yeah. Uh, his, his last name is Mori, M-O-R-I. Uh, and he is a green lawyer? He's a green lawyer. He's a. Uh, yeah, right. Yes. Uh, and you say he's being sent to. Well, Iraq. You know, he's definitely. I, yes, he's being sent to Iraq. Not as, as punishment, but as. as uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get into people's motives. Um, it was time for him to rotate through. Uh, while he won his case before, uh, you know, his guy is going to get out of Guantanamo Bay, he was passed over for promotion, moved to. Uh, Miramar in uh, yeah, Miramar in California and his New Zealand was joined by Iraq shortly, but the nice to keep him in the office of military commissions, but uh, uh, he moved on. You don't think this is punitive or you can't say or he was passed over for I think it's punitive. <laughs> um, I mean if, if everybody gets passed over for promotion when you do that job. Charlie Swift won his case before the Supreme Court. Uh, I would think that'd be enough to get you promoted to lieutenant colonel or, or uh, lieutenant, lieutenant, or senior commander of the Navy. Apparently not. Um, and now he's out teaching law at uh, uh, at Emory. Dan did a wonderful job. He passed over. He's down in, in Miramar. Um, no one's been promoted out of this job yet. I'm the road lawyer running around out of uniform in uh, in Iowa. So you know, do I think it's punitive? Sure, I do. Do I? You take jobs like that, you don't think you're going to get promoted anyway. It should rarely in your face so much that uh, you're not going to be able to treat well in your own. I need to take another question. Anybody else have a question for us? Yeah. I have a question. How long have they been up to the There used to be upwards. They've been upwards between, between the numbers are hard to tell, are hard to determine. There used to be between 900 and 1,000. Right now there are roughly 340. Um, and while, while the president has said, you know, he wants to close it as soon as he can, and everyone says, oh, we need to close one time away, except that Romney wants to double it. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that there's now 340, we added somebody last week. So uh, the numbers change a little bit. It all depends on where you're from. If you're from uh, a Western nation, you get to go home, generally. If you're from Saudi Arabia or Yemen, you don't get to go home. In Afghanistan, you get to go home because we're trying to show the Afghan government how we, uh, that we're, we're good folks. Um, and that's, a, I mean, that's one of the unfortunate aspects of it. So it changes, 340 is a big number. Yeah. Secondly, do you and Trump wish to meet Trump and Trump and the other thing you'd like for Trump to be in the United States? No. Well, and I, and I say that, you know, I get asked all the time, a lot of times people ask, oh, who's shooting the heat? Whether I personally believe that or not, I, you know, we're not going to be on the piece of the commander-in-chief during the war. 
uh, and whether we're, war, whether we're, we're at war with Al-Qaeda, and that's, an, uh, that's a war, we're certainly at war in Iraq, um, so you can't go after the hands of the um, I think that these guys, the Donald Rumsfeld was indicted, uh, I believe, in Germany. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if some of the, the Western European nations had you know, some indictments come down, uh, but I don't think there's going to be anything of the nature of you know, what happened you know, after Europe with the Nazis. I mean, unfortunately, you know, I mean, we're fortunately, we're, the, we're still the, the superpower uh, behind the enemy. And as long as, as long as we are, you know, we're just, we need to be dictators. And do I think people have done bad things? I think it's some terrible, terrible policy decisions. Um, and, 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 you know, opting out of the application of unique convention is, is mind boggling. As a military lawyer, we live and die with those things. And that, just, that puts my friends at risk. Put my friends at risk. It put. It continues to put my friends at risk. Um, you know, you 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 just don't know how to teach them either. That's just it's unfathomable. So certainly bad, bad decisions were made. Um, I don't think we're going to find Any other questions, sir? Um, yeah, I hope you learned to keep her off uh, in the time. Oh, this is not going to make up the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess it just depends. On that. Um, I, uh, <laughs> of course, I prefer. But, um, <laughs> I'm doing a study on psychological operations uh, in terms of the U.S. military. It's good stuff. There's a lot of stuff out there. Yeah, the Sears School. <coughs> Perhaps all of them. Um, well, uh, what data do you have to support your contention that torture is in fact? Um, I have data from there's there's studies in there's studies in. Uh, in Canada that dealt with a um, what was the concept of touchless torture, which is what the CIA sort of embraced, which is this you know, isolation, no light, no no sound. Uh, there were studies done up in Canada which which showed the, the effects of that. You know, unfortunately there's um, there's there's all sorts of studies regarding uh, and this isn't necessarily on the concept that torture is not reliable. Uh, but the, the, the prison guard studies out of Stanford, with the Stanford, where they had the prison guards, people grab people off the street and said, You're a guard, you're an inmate, and after a week and a half, the guards actually kicked the hell out of the inmate and acting like guards, and these are all college students running around. Um, there's that stuff. Uh, a lot of the, you'll find that there's a great deal of research on the concept on the, of coerced confessions, and coerced confessions, if, if there's certainly evidence that they're unreliable. Um, I don't have the studies off the top of my head. You should go Google a guy named Richard Off. Uh, excuse me, Richard Leo, Richard Offshe. Um, uh, those are probably two of the leading American folks on course confessions, and they go into a great deal of some of the studies they've done. And, uh, you know, do I believe that you can get good evidence from torture? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, but you're going to get bad evidence from torture, too. And I, I, how do you tell if the good evidence is bad evidence? And I think that's probably one of the reasons why you go torture, because you can always tell uh, whether it's good or bad, other than it's just not a Christian thing to do. Um, you know, torture because you don't know what you're getting. If, you're not, if I want to board a Jew, you're, and wanted you to give up Gavin, you're going to give up Gavin, whether Gavin did it or not. Um, I, I have no way of telling or finding out whether that evidence is reliable. But there's, there's, that's a great topic that you're going to write on. And uh, the R.B. Sears School, S-E-R-E, comes out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, they do, they train special forces on how to survival, evasion, resistance, evacuation, I believe what it stands for. And there's the, the psychologists at, that were running the SEER program teaching Americans how to um, not give up, uh, how, how not to be interrogated and give up information. Those same psychologists ended up in Guantanamo Bay, teaching the American interrogators what you need to do in order to overcome one's will. So there's a great deal of, of uh, research on that, and I think you're going to find that to be an interesting topic. I mean, and that's, that's, that's just that good. Congratulations, you're in college. You have plenty of years to do it. <laughs> Sir? Is there ever been other times in history when the foreign justice system switched? Uh, I don't know if it was the uh, Hillary Institution there, or uh, did you have that kind of money? What determines us 
Time. I think that, you know, I, and this is all just personal opinion, but that I think I'm going to raise on maybe even all of you. Um, you know, eventually uh, you, fear dissipates and, and you begin to act right. And, and then that, well, what happens at that time? Is you sit back as a nation and you say, my gosh, what do we do to the Japanese in World War II? The Japanese, that was, a, that was our, our worst moment in American history when we had a slave and women didn't vote. Um, you, you come around, and I, I, I have no doubt in my mind, none whatsoever, that in the future, what happens, what are our actions in particular, whether you are for or against the Iraq War and whether we should be or not be in Iraq, um, at least that's a war. Um, I, I have no doubt that, that our actions in Guantanamo Bay are going to be viewed negatively. Um, you know, Franklin Roosevelt had a military commission in 1942. Clearing with the Nazi saboteurs who landed on the shores of uh, uh, Long Island and a few of them in Florida, and then they got gathered up and taken to DC and we had a weird military trial, and uh, they ended up being convicted, and a few of them were executed. Then the Supreme Court decided that the people that the trial were okay, so it's a good thing because a couple of them are dead. Um, hard to get those guys back and get them in relief from the dead. But, um, you know, when you, when you talk to that, when you read the uh, The, uh, the memoir by the, his, um, how did his name escape? His attorney general. Uh, he said that, you know, that, that decision I haunts me in my divorce from the piece of advice I ever gave the, the, the president. Um, yeah, he, people talk about the Dred Scott decision, and now you've got the Dred Scott decision, and the courts come back 30 years later and say this is a terrible, terrible time. I, I have no doubt that's going to happen. Uh, it's going to be a matter of when. And I, I certainly think it's, uh, it, it would be sooner with the regime change than, sooner conversely with the regime change than not having the regime change. Um, I, I, I think, unfortunately, and I, I don't say this, it sounds like it's a joke, but it's not. You know, Americans, we just, we just don't care much. Um, and that's why, I mean, that's going on with Scott Chapman and all their. Not Cuba. There's nothing Cuban about it. It's a you know, McDonald's and you and you drink it. There's no Cubans anywhere around Guantanamo Bay. Um, but you know, it doesn't affect us. The new iPhone is out. We have bigger issues to look at. Um, I hope that in the future we get a little more you know, civic minded, I suppose, and recognize that we can get a little more involved in what's happening around the world rather than you know, out of sight of our mind. But we'll try to go the rest of the time. <coughs> Any other questions? I don't like the name of my son. So, just a short one, but uh, oh, I'm not good. <laughs> your question, maybe. The answer, not so much. <laughs> What's your personal opinion on how to tie a nation into the war with Iraq? Okay. <laughs> well, look, and I, and I say this with, and I, when you're, you know, I think about your now, say these things about the Iraq war or about our. What we're doing as a, as a country and in one you know, it would be completely different about the uniform in Iraq. And when you're a soldier in Iraq, you fight the war you're given, and um, you don't. I wouldn't question publicly. Uh, I mean, yeah, I question privately, but I wouldn't question publicly. Certainly, I'm doing um, because you know, people are fighting these wars. You know, they're, they're taking orders and they're they're trapped. So that's it. There's certainly uh, the, the support of the troops. Um, my personal belief is that the Iraq war is not going to be won militarily. Um, that it's going to be won ideologically. I believe that if, and you hear that you know, we have all these Al Qaeda fighters in Iraq. I understand that at least less than one half of one percent of the insurgents in Iraq are Al Qaeda fighters. Everybody else is just gangs, um, various militia of warlords, folks coming from various countries. The foreign fighters are not Al Qaeda in Iraq. I believe if we withdrew troops from Iraq and moved them where they should be, which I believe in Afghanistan, uh, and the Pakistan border right where the troop front is, that if Al Qaeda wants to fight us, they'll probably leave Iraq and come to Afghanistan and engage us there where we probably shouldn't be, rather than having two fronts on with, with Al 
Al-Qaeda, we have one front with Al-Qaeda. Now that makes sense to me, but I'm not a uh, military scholar. It just seems that I can already divide my troops when I have one front. Um, but so I, you know, I think that you win the war in Iraq by convincing the, the many people in the Middle East that we're not there to take over your nation and take over your, take over your, your area, that um, we're, we're, treat, we're going to treat people well, we're going to fight in Afghanistan. I believe that, that you know, I mean, I may be wrong, maybe Iraq would just be an absolute mess. Who knows? It may even be worse than it is now. Who knows? Um, but I believe that there's certain vested interests that the Syrians, the Iranians, the, the uh, Saudis, the Kuwaitis, uh, everybody has an interest in Iraq and everybody has an interest in peace in Iraq, hopefully. So I don't think it's going to be any worse. I think you, you win a, an asymmetrical warfare by making sure that you're, you're attacking with more high ground and uh, that you're, you're, you're leading by the end of the day.